Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am excited to introduce our guests. Legendary playwright, screenwriter, and actor Harvey Firestein is the Tony Award-winning author of Torch Song Trilogy and La Caja Faux. He also won Tonys for his performances in Torch Song and as Edna Turnblatt in Hairspray. And he wrote the books for Newsies, Kinky Boots, and Casa Valentina. His play, A Catered Affair, was nominated for 12 Drama Desk Awards, and he has appeared in dozens of films and television shows, including Mrs. Doubtfire, Independence Day, Cheers, and The Good Wife. As if that weren't enough, and it's only scratching the surface, Fires revised the book for the forthcoming Broadway revival of Funny Girl, and now he's written an instant New York Times bestseller, I Was Better Last Night. But tonight, he'll be in conversation with Catherine Cohen, who hosts a weekly cabaret show at Alan Cummings East Village venue, Club Cumming. Catherine recently published her first book, God, I Feel Modern Tonight, a comedic collection of poetry. And if you tune into Netflix on Tuesday, you can catch the premiere of her first comedy special, The Twist, She's Gorgeous. Catherine, Harvey, I'm so glad you're joining us. The screen is yours. I'm leaving. <laughs> Please stay. Why did he say you're gorgeous and not me? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm leaving. And he's and he's left me out of it. I don't know. Oh, I can't. I can't work like this. You're gorgeous. Look at this. This is serving America's next top model with the hand on the yeah. face. Well, I yeah, people it. ask why you put the hand on the face, because it covers everything else. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining so me. Nice. I'm so excited to chat with you. It's such an honor to meet you. Thank I have you. to tell you, <laughs> I have to tell you, a Hairspray was the first musical I ever saw on Broadway. Oh, was it? I went home and I sang Good Morning Baltimore in my Houston middle school talent show. I had to, I had to, I loved it so much. And um, I've been curled up all weekend with your amazing book. Look at this, stunning. And I, I was telling Andy, it feel, it's so warm. It, feel, it made me feel very taken care of. So funny and the way you approach the, the light and dark moments with such ease. It was just, it went by too fast. I need more. Well, yeah, there, there always will be more because I got a typewriter. Yeah, there we go. There we go. If you have a need, I have a typewriter. We can we can take care of this, no problem. I said I said um, you know because they're already they are hawking me a China uh, about whether to, you you're Cohen right so you understand if I speak Italian like hawking me China, um, or the, or no you don't speak Yiddish uh, here and there no Yiddish oh, okay means uh, hawk me in China means hit me in the head okay knocking, they knock me in the head so they're, they're hawking me in China they're making me crazy how's yeah. that making me crazy. Yeah. That I can um, understand. Yeah, okay. They make me crazy. That they keep saying, you know, the, the book is a, a, a New York Times bestseller in a, in a week. So you you, you got to have another book in you. And I said, well, I do. I said, because um, I, did, I didn't write very much about boyfriends in this. I have a, a long list of, of, um, of, 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 of victims. And um, so I thought, <laughs> you know, maybe I would just do a book just telling stories of, of the men in my life. And I thought I'd call it Bottomless. <laughs> I could I'd smell another hit. Oh yeah. Well, it's gonna smell all right, but I don't know. <laughs> so, did you always want to write a memoir? No, I never. No, no, no. How did it? How did it happen to you? Well, COVID. Yeah. Was, COVID. I mean, uh, COVID hit, and then Broadway got shut down. It was two years ago this week, okay. and um, you know, and I came up to my office and I went. Um, and so I cleaned my desk. Mm -hmm. Looks great. What to do? And COVID was still here. So <laughs> I went to the kitchen. I cleaned the refrigerator. Um, but when it came to cleaning the, the uh, freezer, I said, no, there's got to be other things to do besides cleaning <laughs> So um, my agent said, why don't you try writing a memoir? And I said, because I don't write prose that way. I, I, I've written op-ed pieces and I, I, I even write commentary on my own stuff. But a book is like a scary kind of thing. And then I thought of my own advice that I do give in the book, which is uh, life does not change if you say no. It's only mm. yes. And I thought, 
who's gonna see it? It's a, you know, it's a computer, it's a keyboard. I can sit here, I can type and stuff and nobody's ever gonna know that I did it or I didn't do it. So um, I started writing and I wrote the, the, not the preface, but I wrote the first story that's in the book. The one about being uh, in second grade and wanting to be the evil queen. Mm -hmm. the evil cast as a king. So I wrote that story and it's about how Philomena in my second grade class got to be the evil witch and I had to be the king. And so I wrote that story and I sent it to Philomena because we've been friends since kindergarten. We're still Amazing. friends now. And I sent it to her figuring if it meant anything to her, maybe it'll mean something to somebody else. That's usually the way I figure things. If it means something to someone, it'll mean something to someone else. So mm -hmm. I sent it to her and she sent back the photograph that's in the book. Oh, it's an amazing photo. Yeah, of me at seven years old in, in drag. And she had kept that photograph all these years. And so I said, okay, if it meant something to her, let's, mm -hmm. let's keep going. And so we did. And uh, and here we are. And here we are. Many chapters later. I love the title so much. I was better last night. Is that something you've always felt? Because I think you're getting better with age. Well, it's, it's, it's. You know, it's a, something that theater people think about. I was mm -hmm. better last night because, um, you know, your friends come backstage uh, after a performance and you always think, oh, if you had just seen it last night, last night, really, oh, I was right on it. Oh, I was right on it. Of course, people only see the performance they see and they never know, you know, they and, and they can't judge one performance from another. You know, it's like, they'll, if they're nice, they'll nod. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean anything to them. So, yeah. But but it means so much to us who say I was better last night. So that's why I called it that. But I also used to think that that was the absolute ideal um, uh, saying for a, for a tombstone. <laughs> yes. You know, is it not true? You know, once you're buried, you're probably not getting any better. No, that's kind of the end, yeah, isn't last it? Night, yeah, I was better. Last, but but I, I, I've since, you know, decided that that uh, I'm probably going to go the... Uh, the um, Lou Grant way. Remember Lou Grant from the Mary Tyler Moore show? And oh, yeah. America, yeah, you're so young. I'm it's like <laughs> talking to my, it's like talking to, I have, I have underwear older than you. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, Lou Grant on the Mary Tyler Moore show, they said, how do you want to, how do you want to be buried? And he said, when I die, just put my hat on and stand me up in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I've kind of said it that way. Yeah, I want to be thrown sort of near a tree, I think. Oh, is that what you want? Just not yeah, even, something not even covered over the leaves? Not even covered yeah. over the leaves? No, just near, just something like that. But I wanted to ask you, because you were talking about, you know, saying yes to life versus saying no. You, you have so, you go over so many projects in the book. You're working at a million things at once. How do you know when you want to say yes to something? And how, it, has there been an occasion when you have had to say no? And how has that affected you? And did you regret it? Or just, yeah, I'm curious about your process. I, um, the one thing I don't want to do is regret. Yeah. I have found that regret is much harder to deal with than failure. Failure mm -hmm. I can deal with. Because mm -hmm. failure means you tried, you did something. And even if you're absolutely heartbroken at failure, mm -hmm. you know that over time it will become a funny story. You'll, <laughs> totally. You know, it, it just, but regret never turns into a funny story. Regret, mm -hmm. just regret. So I really try not to regret stuff. Um, just before we got on this optical illusion, mm -hmm. uh, I still don't believe this really exists. I'm so, not real. I'm yeah, they make they I robot. Think half of this is like leftover drugs from the seventies. <laughs> um, but just before this, somebody called me and offered me something, something big too, mm -hmm. and. Um, and I thought, how? And I have to make up my mind rather quickly. And I thought, how am I going to make up my mind? My mind is so filled with uh, other stuff I'm doing right now because I've got right. the book just launching. Funny Girl is in final rehearsals. It, it moved into oh. the theater today. Oh, no, I'm so today. excited. Tomorrow they move into the theater and start rehearsing on the stage. And I've got um, uh, 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 a lot of this stuff going on. And then... Uh, somebody's developing a TV show for me. I don't, it's never going to happen. Um, <laughs> but I've got, I have a whole bunch of things going on at once. And I said, so how do I now decide about this? Because I don't want to, it's kind of an exciting thing. So um, 
sometimes what I do is I just call a bunch of people. Yeah. I call a bunch of friends and see what they have to say. Um, not that I ever take anybody's advice, but uh -huh. I, do, but I think it's interesting to see what their first reaction is. So I called my brother and he said, absolutely not. Which uh -huh. made me, Let's keep going. Uh, then I called, <laughs> I called one of my agents, my oldest agent, when, when he and I met, he was in the mail room at William. Uh -huh. I was his very first client. Uh -huh. So I called him. He said, it's a good idea. I thought, okay, maybe I shouldn't do it. And then, uh, then I called a producer friend of mine and she said, let's not throw this away so quickly. Let's think. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I am. So I'm still, we're, we're one yes, one uh, no, one let's think. I think, um, it's I only think an hour ago. I, 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 do you want my advice? I think, I yes, think it sounds are. like, an, I think it sounds like an amazing opportunity. You see that? See that? <laughs> So we will think this through. And that's sort of the way you have to do it. You don't like when I was offered Fiddler on the Roof. Oh, um, yeah. Well, you know, it's like I said, <laughs> I had just finished two years in hairspray yeah. and really wanted some time off. And right. I wanted to just write. And because I'm a kind of a hermit, I like my really quiet life. And then being in the theater makes you a very public figure. And so I said, oh, do I really want to take it on? So I called Jack O'Brien, the director of Hairspray. And I said, Jack, what do I do? And he said, very wisely, he said, you either do it or you spend the rest of your life telling people that you were offered it. And they go, yeah, sure. Oh. And you sort of had to do it. Otherwise, people wouldn't believe it. <laughs> And I'm really glad I did. And had I I'm not, done it, did. and had I not done it, I would be regretting it now. Totally. You know, you, you talk a lot in the book about how you never thought of yourself as a Broadway actor or performer. Was there a moment, you know, you write about the rubber band moment in the book of realizing you can support yourself and you have enough money, you've made it. But was there a moment when you felt like, oh, I'm an actor, this is my thing? Uh, you know, most showbiz books, start with like, you know, and then I was a kid and I went to the movies and I looked up at the screen and I said, that's going to be me someday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not me. I never wanted to be a writer. I never wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be an artist. Um, but artist is, um, is a 1950s uh, word for gay. <laughs> oh, he's artistic. Oh, no, he's artistic. <laughs> So, so being an artist was fine with me. Um, and I didn't think I was a very good artist, but I went to the High School of Art and Design, which was really a vocational school. Mm -hmm. So we learned to do paste ups, we learned to cut mats, we learned to print photographs. They taught us all this technical stuff. And I knew that in the world of art, I may not be Andy Warhol, but I could work for Andy Warhol and pull silk screens and do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I thought that's what I would be, is I'd be somewhere in the world of art. But once again, just having people ask you, you know, I had this friend in high school whose mother was starting a community theater group. And she said, can you get a bunch of the kids to come down to the church? Because um, they had no money for posters. And um, I'll buy some magic markers and some cardboard and you'll all make signs, you know, advertising the show. And so I said, sure, I'll go down there. So we went down, we got, you know, being high school students, we got stoned on the smelling the magic markers and they said <laughs> want to pull the curtain for the show and I said yeah sure and the next thing I knew I was in theater you know I was in community theater but that was theater and um and that's the way my life has gone it's it's like I was raised by Ellen Stewart who is La Mama for mm -hmm. any of your people would know La Mama at Experimental Theater Club definitely and that's where I began and Ellen was was my spiritual mama and I we were together from I was 16, 17 when I met her until her death. And uh, and she taught me to always say no. Hmm. She said, say no. When somebody asks you to do something, say no. And then think about it. If you change your mind and say yes later, you are a hero. You've just made them so happy. But mm -hmm. if you decide to stick with no, you haven't disappointed them anymore. By the time you've thought about it, they're already over it. Right. And I thought, that's not right. That's not right. When you're living your life all day long, people are asking you to do stuff. 
Mm-hmm. You don't even hear it. You don't even hear it. Somebody calls you up and says, you want to go for coffee? You want to do this? You want to do that? We don't even hear it. It's just automatic that we say no, because I'm doing something. I'm busy. I'm reading this. I have to get this done. I can't meet you for coffee. I got to do this. Truthfully, nothing happens if you say no. Mm-hmm. If you say no, you're going to finish whatever's on your desk. That's true. But you don't know what would have happened had you gone out for coffee. Maybe nothing at all. Maybe you would have met the love of your life. Maybe mm-hmm. you would have got hit by a car. Maybe you would have done a scratch off and won a billion dollars. You don't know. But saying no doesn't change anything. Only saying yes does. So as much as I can in my philosophy and advice to people is as much as you possibly can, try and say yes and see what it happens, see what where it takes you. So by saying yes, um, I was offered this, I was offered that, I did this, I did that. Somebody said, write a play, I wrote a play, you know, and, and life happens. So I didn't plan it. I, I, I was not one of those people driven to have a career. People say, you know, did you, how hard was it to become a Broadway star? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Start out wanting to be a Broadway star. It was never a goal of mine. It's a lovely thing. And I certainly appreciate it. But um, it's just about saying yes. Amazing. But you've, I mean, once you started saying yes, you kept working so hard for so many years. I'm so curious. You talk a lot about your working hard. You have to, no matter what you do, you better work hard. You're not going to work hard at it. Then, then really don't bother. If it's not something you can do, it's not something that, that, that inspires you to work hard, then don't even bother. Stay home. You're only (laughs) going to annoy the people who are working hard. Totally. Yeah. How do you take care of yourself when you're working on so many projects at once? And I know you've struggled with your voice and everything. I'm so curious. Are there like any rituals or things you like to do while you're in a show or? Yeah, but the, 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 you know, you just do, you learn you about yourself over the years. I'm, I'm going to be 70 in June. So wow. um, it's, I've been doing this a really long time. So you, you know, you figure yourself out, you, you know, who you are, you know, how things feel, you know, what's right for you, what's, you know, sometimes you make mistakes. When, when I was doing Bella Bella, mm-hmm. uh, this play that I wrote about Bella Abzug, it was a one-man show at the Manhattan Theater Club, and um, they came to me with the schedule, and I said, you know, it's only 80 minutes long, and I can knock off two of these a day for several days in a row and then have an extra day off instead. Well, by the time I was done, my ego just really said I can do anything it's only 80 minutes uh, and um and I put together a schedule that nearly killed me I mean I, oh my god yeah I ended up on steroids and oh no oh, it was a mess I actually had to miss one performance and yeah because I, I I had so messed up that schedule that I ended up I think it was 14 days without a day off and double shows every day it was just oh my god insane it, so yeah so so your ego can lead you in the wrong that's one thing that can lead you in the wrong direction if, totally. you, if you just believe in yourself too much you can get in trouble and I, <laughs> a couple of times i've gotten myself in trouble that way but mm-hmm. but um but i did learn from that and i would never do that again <laughs> wow and when you were growing up was your family always supportive of your artistic aspirations i know you and your brother are so close and yeah. such a so oh, nice thing about your relationship well, my father, my father called us the bandits, which is Yiddish for, for crooks. Because <laughs> um, he never thought that e- either one of us, my brother or I, could earn a living. Um, wow. He was sure we would never be able to earn a living. He was just so sure we would just starve in the street. He used to say to us all the time, you do know I'm not leaving you anything, right? You, you, you know, when I die, nothing. So you really need to get a job or do something. Um, he really didn't have a lot of faith. He did live long enough to see me um, make more money than he was making up per week. Oh. But, uh, but, um, and, and my, but yeah, yeah. So my, my family was very, very supportive of whatever. My mother loved the arts. Mm-hmm. That's that I went into the arts. Um, and my brother was in the arts also, but he was smart enough to go back to school and get his degree as a lawyer. And he became a lawyer, which has allowed him to do all kinds of stuff, um, including running my life. <laughs> <laughs> my brother does run my life, which is, which oh. is good. Because who, 
well, who are you going to trust? You know, it's like I say, if he bankrupts me, you know, his, his kids are going to get whatever I have. So if he bankrupts me, then his kids get nothing and I'm going to move in with him. There we go. So it you makes sense to make sure I don't, I don't end up bankrupt. Sounds great. How I'm curious, reading about when Torch Song became a hit was so you was so beautiful in the book. What was that like for you when all of a sudden it was, you know, you thought it was gonna shut and then everything just the world opened to you? What was that like? I didn't think it was gonna shut. I hoped it would shut. Oh, okay. The show, we had moved the show from off off Broadway to off Broadway, mm -hmm. where it became this unbelievable hit. And I tell the story, and all these stories are in the book, but I tell the story in the book that I came up out of the subway one day and saw a line from the box office on 7th Avenue around that went wrapped around the corner past the liquor store and disappeared around the second corner. And I thought, oh my God, I'll never get out of this. This is <laughs> it. It was a small theater so we could easily sell it out. And, and, I, and I was writing La Caja Fall already, and I had finished a play called Spook House. So I had these two things I wanted to go off and do, but I'm stuck doing Torch Song. And I'm thinking, I'm like, oh my God, how do I get out of this? And they came to me and asked if we would move to Broadway. And I said, no. And then I thought, you know what? It'll never make it on Broadway. So I'll let it move to Broadway. I'll get some money because they have to pay you to go to Broadway. I'll get a Broadway credit, you know, to say on my resume, he was on Broadway. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the show will close and I can go on with my life. It ran five years. Wow. And why did you think it wouldn't make it on Broadway? Well, we talked about this <laughs> on the air. I, I've already promised to not use the, the terminology. Andy, Andy has asked me not to use the terminology to tell you the story <laughs> of why it would not make it on Broadway. But let us just say the show was a little raw. Fair this enough. So was Torch Song was not your 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 average Broadway fare for the time. There was not a lot of honest. Uh, depictions of gay life and right. this was, and this was a play that was certainly was an honest de depiction of gay life so um so i didn't i di i just didn't think i mean i've i'd seen other shows try on mm -hmm. broadway and not make it um you know even some of the boys in the band only played off broadway um right. they didn't try to bring it to broadway um staircase bombed um there were a lot of gay plays that didn't make it. So I had no great dreams that it was going to, and then it yeah. did. Amazing. And then what was it like to kind of begin to transition into some film and TV stuff? I, I Mrs. Doubtfire is like one of my all time favorite movies. It's a, it's a classic, it's the best. What was it, was that one of your favorite things you've ever worked on or what was your favorite film role? No, I don't like movies or television at all. Really? Uh, I do it, I, I, I do. I used to do one movie or one um, one or two voices a year so mm -hmm. that I to pay for health care. Yeah. Because, you know, on your union, well, you know this, on your union, you have to make a certain amount of money each right. year, plus, plus the money you make from residuals in order to keep your health care. <laughs> so I would do one or two movies a year or one or two voices. I, I finally realized I could do voices, and I this way I didn't even have to get dressed up and go do a movie. But... Um, movies it's a different energy a completely different energy it's not that i hate them um i love watching movies um i just don't like being in them and uh because you sit around all the time you're you know it's all about the technical thing it's all about getting the lighting right and getting the camera in the right place and all that stuff and so you're sitting in the trailer sort of dying saying let me go home and slip my wrists rather than sit, <laughs> sit in this trailer for another hour you know, I hear and, you. Some, and some people know how to do it. Like I remember Sally Field, she learned to um, needlepoint. She'd been doing television since she was 17, 18 years old. And so I think everyone in her family and all of her friends have seven, 800 needlepoint pillows. Oh my um, God. Cause that's what she did. She would just sit in needlepoint and some people did drugs. Um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, um, I couldn't even, I couldn't write because you never knew when they were going to call you and, and you, and you're in a, like a little trailer. I didn't, just don't like it. 
No, so I, so I, do, I do it when it's a favor for a friend or whatever, like Billy Eichner. Um, oh, love. Billy on the street. Amazing. He, he just wrote and starred in a movie and called me up and said, would you do uh, a guest spot on it? And I said, mm. and he said please. <laughs> and I said, okay, if you get rid of me in one day, you make it a tiny roll so I can come in, shoot one day and gone. And um, and that's what he did for me, which was very sweet. Of okay. course, I still had to get up at three o'clock in the morning to get Ooh. there and didn't get out of there till 10 at night. Like I said, that, you know, you do a Broadway show. The show's two hours long, you're in, you're out. <laughs> <laughs> Are you eager to get back on stage? Um, Maybe, I don't know. Um, It's gotta be the right thing. Yeah. Um, like I said, I don't do, that's, that's not just who I am. You know, I don't just write, I don't just act. I don't, I don't just make quilts. I don't just paint. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do all kinds of things and they all interest me. So, totally. and, I, and, I, and I'm also a hermit. I do have no problem of just locking myself in my house with my dogs and, you know, seeing my friends and um, so, uh, unless it's something I really want to do, I have no need to, you know, there are people who just like, what's next, what's next, you know, right. that's just not me. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited to see Funny Girl. What was the process like of revising the book? It was difficult because it's been seven years. Wow. They called me like, I think like six years, maybe six years ago, they called me. David Babani and and um, Sonia Freeman, these two wonderful English producers. And mm -hmm. David Babani has a small theater in London called the Mernier Chocolate Factory, where they had done Torch Song. They did La Cage and their fabulous mm -hmm. production of La Cage. They do these like shrunk down versions of Broadway musicals, and many of them have been very successful. And anyway, they the, uh, the, we were already friends, and they contacted me about Funny Girl, and I thought. You know, here's a show that hasn't been revived in 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I said, let me take a look at it. So I, I got the script and I read it. And I saw something that I'd heard all the stories about Funny Girl. They wrote a show and they started putting it up. And I think they went through two choreographers, three directors. People were quitting left and right book writers, everything else. They were out of town. They were in all this trouble. And I know what that feels like to be out of town and in trouble. You just panic. And what happened with Funny Girl was they just glued it together as best they could. They had Barbara Streisand. She was this rock, you know, she was going to give this incredible vocal performance and be funny also. And and so they basically just threw away the show and said, let's just stick her up there. We'll let the whole thing ride on her personality and, and you know, and then we'll get away with it, with that. And they did. They, she was phenomenal in the show and they got away with it and it became a big hit show. It ran a couple of years, but it was the Barbara Streisand show. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody did it in her mold. They, they imitated what she had done. So it wasn't about, this is a show about Fanny Bryce, who's a real mm -hmm. person. And it was telling the Fanny Bryce story, but it sort of became the Barbara Streisand story instead. Right. And so I looked at it and I said, well, we're not under pressure right now. I've got the time to look at the book. I have the time to, to work with the director and see what, what he thinks. And, and so we did that and we, 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 we did it, a lot of it. Um, the people who own the rights, uh, you know, the, 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 the children of the people who actually put it together in the first place, they were a little nervous about letting us change stuff. They held me back a little bit, um, but we created a show, we put it on and it was a huge hit at the Mernier Chocolate Factory. We moved it to the West End, which is Broadway. Uh, it, it ran a year. Then we sent it out on a whole year tour where it did fabulously well. And then we were supposed to bring it into New York and COVID hit. Right. So we had to sit on it for two years. And then I got the call saying, you know, COVID won't last forever. Let's get back to work on it. So all of a sudden I was back at the computer looking at it again. I got to take another look at it. I got to say, okay, now we're doing it not for an English audience, but for an American audience. Um, the, the creators of the original show trusted me a little bit more because mm -hmm. 
who I had made it into a hit in London. So they let me go a little further. And so I, I, I'm very pleased with what we've done. We'll see that, you know, in the long run, the, we, we people who put these shows together, we can do whatever we want and, and, and make ourselves as happy as we like. It's the audience. The audience has to come in and have a good time. If the audience doesn't come in and have a good time, don't mean nothing. So in the long run, we'll see what the audience thinks, but I think they're gonna have a good time. I cannot wait. I love Beanie. I think it's gonna be fabulous. Well, Beanie's a lot of fun. And, and the other thing is, you know, the, the fun part for somebody like me is I don't want the audience to ever know what I did. Mm. Like you're gonna come in, you're gonna see Funny Girl and you shouldn't actually be able to tell what I did and what I didn't do. Did he restructure that? Did he put that song? What happened to that? You should not even know what I did. You should just see the funny girl. of you. It's like Newsies, you know, the kids who fell in love with Newsies when they were little kids, they came to see the show. They could point out a couple of things, you know, that, that they were different. But in the long run, they had no idea how much I had changed. And that's the job of a, of a, a revisionist is to not leave your fingerprints on it to make it look like what it was before. And that's really a fun job. Wonderful. I'm curious, you know, you started in such avant-garde, experimental kind of downtown theater scene, and now you do all kinds of things, you know, mainstream Disney musicals, all kinds of things. What's it, what's it been like, you know, writing for such a larger audience? Like, how was that transition for you? It's not that, you know, it's, you're always writing you're always writing for the truth and you're mm -hmm. not, no, I mean, do you, do you, do you, do you have expectations? It also, it depends on what you're writing. You know, if I'm writing a play and I'm just writing a play myself, I don't think about that at all. I'm just being true right. to the characters. It's my, my job is to present the characters and the story as best I can. And I don't think of the audience. The audience has to catch up to me. When you're writing a musical, you can think that way, but, then you've got a composer and a lyricist, and then it's the three of you doing this work together. And then all of a sudden there's a director and the director's brain comes into it. And, you know, and, it, and, and at some point, then you've got producers and everything else. And at some point, I said this to, to somebody who was writing their first musical. I said this the other day, you know, it could be your sperm and somebody else's egg and somebody mm -hmm. else's and somebody else's womb. But in the long run, that baby is that baby. And that baby mm -hmm. belongs to itself. And it's not yours. And it's not one other person's. The baby is the child is the child. And it will grow up to be who it needs to grow up to be. You can only support it. You can take care of it. You can help it grow. But in the long run, that child is going to be that child. And you and you need to, to let it go. So, so no, you, you don't think of it the way you think of it at all. Your brain just doesn't go there. Totally. And how does it feel having the book, This Child Out in the World? Well, that's different because that is just, that's more like writing a play because that right, is right. You. And I mean, the, the good part is you get it off the, your back, you get all those stories out of your head. Yeah. Uh, the bad part is when somebody says, well, you blah, 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 blah. You go, well, that's not true. Well, I read it in your book. That's the bad part. Is <laughs> can't lie about it anymore but um but beyond that i, I don't know it's, uh, it's also only been out for a little while right <clears throat> i let very few people read it when i was writing it very few of my friends even they were, you know mm. i would like one friend at a time read it because i wanted them to i wanted them to have the experience of reading the book and i didn't want them reading pages or whatever you know some people let you read all kinds of stuff i didn't want that so my friends read it, you know, like two weeks ago when I, when wow. I started getting the copies of the book. Um, and, and it's funny, some people in the book I've never heard from again. <laughs> oh, I guess that's bound to happen. That's um, life. That's exciting. And you have to think about, you know, why maybe they're adjusting to what I said. You know, I'm yeah. telling, I, I'm telling my point, you know, when I wrote the book, before I wrote the book, I called Shirley MacLaine. Um, mm -hmm. written nine, I think nine autobiographies. Wow. And, or memoirs. And, um, and I figured who better than she to give me advice. 
And I asked her and she said, you need to let memory be your editor. Mm. You write what you remember, um, whether it's true or not, it's, it's what's in your heart that that's important. And, um, and I said, well, I care less about myself. There's a lot of people in the book, a lot of that are dead and, um, you know, died very young uh, because of AIDS and other stuff. And, um, and I said, I, you know, I, I want to be true to their stories. And she said, you can't do that. She mm. said, you can only write about how they affected you. If you're really truthful, you're, you're still writing about yourself even when you're writing about them. So just leave it at that and, and tell the truth as, as best as it, it comes up for you, which is what I did. I then changed a lot of names. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of people asked me not to change their names. Um, and, and yeah, but mm. most, I heard, most, I heard, most of the people in the book have really enjoyed. A couple of people are pissed that they're not in the book. I, I, yeah, but I'm sure it's, it's an honor to be included. I know, but it's, you know, it's, it's like you can't name, you know, you just can't keep naming names because the reader goes, should I remember this name? Should I never have yeah. always? That's you, true. You don't want to do that. You don't want it to turn into a, a, a thing where you're just like jerking off your friends by, <laughs> by naming names. I mean, there's one, there's one chapter that starts, I think, um, something like Jill Bray. Jill Bray was a drug addict and blah, 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 blah. And she's never mentioned again in the entire <laughs> But um, it was so important to start it out with with the personal, with there was this person, mm -hmm. and everything came from this person. It was just, you know, artistically, it was important to have her name. Um, but in other things, it's not, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But I did I did get some complaints that they're not in the book. But <laughs> the other reason I put in a, a long acknowledgement at the end. Um, oh. At the end of the book, I did. Give a shout out. In alphabetical order, so I wouldn't get like, how could right. people doing so before me? And then I listed all my pets, so I wouldn't get in trouble with them. Your starting, pets? Starting, yeah, starting with my childhood, with my very first dog, right through my dogs now. Every one of the my pets of my life, uh, about, oh. not the alligator, and not the and and not the and not the uh, hamsters. I didn't bother with the hamsters or the <laughs> alligator. I think they're going to be pretty upset. They did. It is what it is. Have you kept journals or diaries throughout your life, or is this truly just from from the heart? I, you know, I'm a very bad journal keeper. I, I, you know, like like most people, you only keep a journal when you're really bored or really in pain, and then really they're, they're, no, they're no use. You know, yeah. when you're writing when you're writing out of that emotional well, 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 that's what you're writing. Well, 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 it makes sense. <laughs> if you're writing just that, I mean, I have a diary which actually is holding up this computer. Uh, my computer is held up by the two volume set of Stephen Sondheim's Look, I Made a Hat, oh. a hat which, which is how I chose my editor of my book because he edited those two books for Sondheim. And then oh, wow. the book all the way at the bottom is, is this diary, which I've had since the early seventies. And I think there's maybe 25 pages written on it. <laughs> It's hard to fill them up. I agree. It's it's for when you're depressed. There's no reason to. I was the only part of it that was that sort of because I did look at it before I wrote the book and while I was writing the book. And I do have several dreams that were interesting to to go back and try and figure out what mm -hmm. those dreams were. But none of that ended up in the book. Just reminds you you're one silly. <laughs> what I think we're almost gonna head to the QA, but I'm curious That's what good. advice. What advice do you have for young artists starting out in uh, in the world right now? Go get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's good advice. That's, <laughs> the advice. that's the advice I kept getting. Go get a real job. I I went to school. Um, you know, my, my I lived this very funny triple life. I was this nice Jewish boy who lived mm -hmm. at home, and you know, lived this nice life. Then I was going to art school during the day. So that was that double life, and 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 I was studying to to be an artist, but I also was taking enough credits to be a teacher. All oh, right. And then at night, I was in this the underground theater and art movement. So what was really funny was, I'd go to history of art, and my teacher would lecture about somebody, and then I'd be spending the evening with that person and say, okay. "Oh, you heard the lecture about you today." 
And, you know, so I knew these people. So I didn't even take tests to, 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 to get out of college. I just gave out tickets to my shows or introduced them. <laughs> I mean, you know, how many people do you know uh, who knew Anais Nin? You know, it's like- That story is insane. Yeah, do you still read tarot? Well, no, no, no. You didn't know. You know where the tarot cards are. I told the truth of where they are. Wow, really? No, did Never not, again. They were buried. They were buried by the uh, Alice in Wonderland statue in Central Park. That was amazing. Yeah. So. Fabulous. Well, thank you. Should we turn to some of the Q and A yeah, questions? Yeah, do what they want. If y'all are watching and you want to ask Harvey a question, just feel free to type in the Q and A questions. Let's see what we what do we have here. Mm. Maybe Andy's Andy. wife is back. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. This says um, Topher asks, "Can you share a memory or two about working with and knowing Robin Williams?" Uh, yeah. I mean, once once again, you know, it's a, it's one of those things. That there's more subtlety to it in the book. Um, mm -hmm. But but I I loved Robin. I loved working with him. He was. Uh, he was a, a very um, uh, obviously a genius, but he he was very disciplined. You know, you think of him as being totally undisciplined, but it takes a lot of discipline to train your brain to do what he did. Mm -hmm. To just do that 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 stream of consciousness that's a lot of work. You know, he he admired Jonathan Winters and and um, and learn and learn from Jonathan Winters to to do that and then he studied that and and trained himself and he became this absolute master at, at stream of consciousness and it was fascinating to watch um but obviously that wasn't the the best parts of him hmm. yeah, those were the private totally another listener viewer asks how have theater audiences changed throughout your career oh a very very different. Oh, it's a, there's a story in the in the book about about Torch Song specifically. When we opened Torch Song on Broadway, the audiences were probably eighty to eighty five percent heterosexual, hmm. and, and then the the gays that came in, the fifteen percent of gays that would come in, were sort of like you know with hoodies up, you know, and they're sneaking into the theater. Nobody should see them going into a gay play um, yeah. or, or, you know, or bringing a date, you know, female date with them or whatever. There was a, there was a danger. There was a, um, there was a, a, a it, it was, the, it was like going to the black market, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was something dangerous and, and wonderful and, and sitting there and, and hearing something so revolutionary, somebody demanding respect and all that. It was, um, I, I, it was dangerous. I guess that's, that's the best word for it. Uh, they revived the show in 2018. Um, and I'm sitting there in the audience, watching the audience come in, and now it's 85% gay. Mm -hmm. They're not walking in hidden. They're walking in with ownership of it. They're walking in with pride. They're walking in bringing younger people with them to see what they saw, or younger people who knew about it, coming mm -hmm. to see what this was that they'd heard about years ago. And the show didn't even belong to me anymore. It belonged to the community. It was theirs. And they had ownership of it, and um, and that was very fascinating. And still, and still, in the third act, when the mother came out, they all turned into five year olds again. Mm -hmm. Just the power of mothers over us. Totally perpetual. Uh, speaking of another question, we have is looking back at the beginning of your professional life. Have LGBTQ plus representation and depiction in film slash stage come as far as you would have thought they'd come? You know, we all, we have stories to tell. I, I don't like thinking, I don't like thinking that anybody can ever represent the community. Nobody can. Mm -hmm. I can't represent the community. You can't represent the community. And it's an absolutely stupid thing to look, to say, I'm going to see Brokeback Mountain because it's going to represent the LGBT. No, it isn't. Right. It's a story. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> Nobody stops Neil Simon and says, what's it like being a heterosexual? <laughs> <laughs> And Plaza Suite, what does that say about heterosexuality? <laughs> you know, it's so totally. it's a stupid idea to even think that someone could, 
It's not, it's, and it's not our job as artists. Our job as artists is to tell a story, to entertain maybe, to, to enlighten, but to tell a story that's hopefully human enough that other people can identify, even if they're heterosexual. Uh, and and uh, so, yeah, so I don't think this idea that a gay, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd. Totally. Well, I, I went back and watched, I'd seen it before your interview with Barbara Walters, where you give the, you know, the famous responses about, you know, I assume everyone's gay until, until proven otherwise. And I thought what, what you wrote about. Right. Yeah, I, I think, I think, I think agree with that for sure. Um, all right, we have time for probably one or two more questions. Let's see. Oh, yeah, you spoke a lot about recovery and sobriety in the book, which I thought was fascinating. Could you comment more about the role of recovery in your life that you write about in the book is what wants someone? Yes. Yeah, the, well, the thing is, um, um, everybody has a different path with mm -hmm. with um, with abuse. Uh, um, and in my business, you know, in, in, in the arts and um, it's like, who isn't in recovery? <laughs> if they're not in recovery, they're actively gonna gonna get there. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so it's not such a strange thing in my world. But I had a lover who was um, who got sober first. Mm -hmm. So I went to Al Anon. So when it was time for me to get sober, um, I already had the twelve step background. I already knew exactly what I was walking into. Um, it, it, there was no great surprise there. So when I went to my first AA meeting, which was you have to you have to read the book because it, because it, it's it, because it doesn't happen overnight. It happens right. over years, you know. But by the time I stopped drinking, I was drinking half a gallon of Southern Comfort a day, uh, hundred proof. So you got to work your way up to that because that will kill you if you try doing that on one day's notice. Um, so by the time I got sober, I was ready to just give it up. I give, I, my, I, I, don't, I don't mean booze. I mean, give up life. Mm -hmm. I was, my life was over. My life, my choices, my life had led me to the end of my life. So I was willing to say, you take it over now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have lived these 25 and a half years, in August, it'll be 26 years. I've lived them as if um, I'm reborn into a uh, a new life and 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 um everything that happens is gift and i don't take anything for granted and i don't feel like i deserve anything it's mm. it's it's all it's all been a gift since then um because the life that i was making for myself was not getting me any place good mm. so yes yeah, so there's a lot of stuff i don't get to to many meetings anymore, um, but most of my friends are, are program people, and not just because uh, you know, it, it's just because you get really bored hanging out with people getting drunk. Uh, yeah, it's, it's enough. It's enough fun. There's a saying, you know, when you hear the alcohol talking, get up and go out and leave. And so, you know, I just rather hang out with people that aren't going to drink, um, and I don't have to listen to it. I know. <laughs> Yeah, totally. You you wrote in the book also about getting bored of casual sex. What was that? I thought that was very interesting as well. What was that like? Um, once again, it's not a story you can really tell. <laughs> I do a library. Oh, yeah. um, um, but uh, well, I, 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 I put it this way. Um, I was doing some activities uh, during which um, a line of Colette's came to me which was when he and he and he became them, mm. I, gave up, I gave up men. Mm. That was the way I felt. I felt like I don't even care anymore. I, this, mm. this, these penises mean nothing to me and uh, these people attached to them mean nothing. Right. And so let me try something else. Totally. Like you spoke about giving up cigarettes. <laughs> that was a fascinating story. I was like, I need to go to this hypnotherapist that you worked yeah, with. I don't know that, that, that I, that's just it. You know, she actually asked me to, to, to write something for her. And I said, but I don't know that that's what did it. I think I was, <laughs> I gave up, I gave up smoking at a, at a spa. That's true. But, um, but I think I was in so much pain at that time. Mm -hmm. that I could have given up anything. I mean, when you're when you're just when you when your soul is in so much pain, it's mm. like you, you're gonna hurt me some more. Go ahead and hurt me. <laughs> Do right. I take 
I feed, take away. I mean, I'm giving up. I get. I did. I give. I give up alcohol. I mean, I'm giving up alcohol, caffeine, and cigarettes. And now, wow. and, and then it was like everyone knows that I'm addicted to diet coke. Well, a caffeine-free diet coke, but I gave that up too. Wow. Uh, so, like every place I go, that they, they they know about me, so they have bottles of diet coke for me. And I say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't drink that anymore either. Wow. I'll drink one just so they don't feel bad that they went and bought a six pack for me, but. <laughs> But yeah, so it does, you know, giving up stuff is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it took sort of five years to feel like you were clear headed or coming back into your life again. How did that change your creative That's what they tell you. That's what they tell yeah. you. Right. They tell you, they tell you that it takes five years to get your marbles back is the way they put it. <laughs> well, they, I mean, in 12 step programs, they tell you don't do anything for the first year. Make no major, make no mm. major changes in the first year. If you're in a bad relationship, but you can stay there, stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're in a bad job, but you can stay there, stay there. Don't make no major change because you're so fragile and you don't really know what you're doing. Um, so I did that. Um, and then, you know, and then I, I sort of, I, I took some jobs and stuff like that, but it did just worked out that at the end of the five years, there was hairspray, you know, and it was Amazing. like, it was kind of like magical. I went, oh, here's my marbles and here's the next real beginning of the next chapter of my life. Mm -hmm. You speak about being an atheist, but do you believe in fate or that things happen for a reason? Complete random. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I love, I, you know, I pray, but yeah. I don't pray to anything. Right. Now, there's nobody sitting in a chair listening, and there's no <laughs> heaven, there's no hell. It's it's just too too random. It's too stupid to think. And I mean, how egotistical do you have to be to think that you can go on after this world? That this, <laughs> out there, there's, a, there's a heaven filled with all these people. And I say, well, if there is a heaven, you know, who do you talk to? I have a lot of <laughs> friends. I, I wouldn't have time to talk to all of them if they if I had to. And yeah. you know, and if you're a and if you're a little kid when you die, you're three. You're gonna stay three years old for eternity and your mother and and if you remarried and the second marriage was better you're still stuck with in the jewish religion you know if this isn't enough to prove that they're just full of crap in the jewish religion the the you know heavy duty uh, chassids believe that if a woman is a great wife and uh you know and, and takes care of the house and keeps kosher and and obeys her husband and does everything the way she's supposed to that when she dies she gets to be her husband's footstool. Oh my God. Yeah. Hell. Ain't that enough to send you out drinking? That's tough. That's tough. Exactly. You can't believe in that crap. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I believe anymore after hearing that. Oh, okay. Well, you That's know, not. Who knows? But I, you talk in the I book also about. You seem to be a smart kind of person. I bet you know. I love that. And I also love that, that, um, that Ron Reagan Jr. commercial. You know, for for the uh, freedom from religion. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Oh, he has a he has a, a, a spot raising money for freedom from religion or, or one of those atheist groups. And and it's like you know, he it says it's very important to keep religion out of our politics and blah blah blah. And it ends with Ron Reagan Jr. Not afraid to burn in hell. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a great way to end a commercial. That's Not a great. Uh, it's a great headstone line as well. Yeah. <laughs> don't look, don't I'm, above. I'm, in, I'm right here. <laughs> I'm curious about you talk about having this major surgery and I would you call it like a near death experience or just what were the emotions you felt after kind of coming waking back up? I was so curious about that. Um that was the, the, yeah that um I I had um a uh, um change of of um of a uh, valve. Yeah, that's what it's called. It's called a valve. Valve. <laughs> Knew I could figure that one out. <laughs> change your mouth. So basically, they they kill you. You know, they shut you off so they can do the work they need to do, and then they put you back online and bring you back to to life. And um, and I was angry when I when I woke up. I mm -hmm. was angry. Like, what the fuck? See, I had promised you'd have to bring up that stuff. And we're in a library. We're in a library, and now we said something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm offended. So, yeah, well, I'm, at least it's you. 
<laughs> oh, um, so when they woke me back up, um, I, I, I was, I was really angry. Like everything was nice and quiet. It was over. Mm -hmm. It was blackness. There was nothing. I knew. I didn't know I was dead. It was just I would knew I was dead when they woke me up. And mm. I said, "That was so nice. Leave me alone." Um, and you bring me back to where I'm freezing cold and wow. I'm angry and I'm in pain and I've got tubes coming out of me everywhere and wires and um and it's and, oh yeah. I was really angry. And I and and I spoke to a bunch of other people who felt the same way after having that kind of an operation. Mm -hmm. And I said, why don't they tell you? Why don't they warn you? You're on this, you know, they they put your brain to sleep, right? But you're not dead. Your mm -hmm. brain actually is recording all of that stuff. It's not recording it in a place that you can bring it back, but you but your brain knows what's going on in the rest of your body. Cool. And, and they don't warn you that you're going to have these very strong feelings from your from being via, so viciously violated. Um, you know, they took saws and they cut you. You know, they and I'm sure there were lots of conversations you really didn't want to listen in on. <laughs> oh my know, God, true. And, uh, and they don't and they don't warn you. And I so whenever I have a friend that goes in for heavy duty surgery, I warn them. You may have these negative feelings when you wake up. You may feel that way. It's because you, these drugs are incredibly powerful. There was all this stuff going on that your brain knows about. Let it go. Just let it breathe through it. Just remember it's it's not real. They're only feelings. Mm -hmm. let, and let it all go. But nobody warned me. Crazy. I, I wish they had. Because I just, what I, my, I, my whole concentration was act happy. Act happy. If you act miserable and you let them know how you're feeling, they'll never let you out of this hospital. Mm. So act happy. I did everything I could. I the second I could get out of bed, I was out of bed, and there was like a little staircase practice, and I was running up and down that staircase to prove I was doing well. And I wouldn't spend any time in my bed at all. I sat out in the in the waiting room. I spent all my time. They believe I was working on the computer. I couldn't concentrate or do anything. But oh I made my god, because I just wanted to look normal to get out of there. And it of worked. Course. I got out much earlier than I should have. Go ahead. <laughs> but it's, but it's, yeah, no, I came home and Frank brought over Chinese food. I was sitting at my dining room table and we're eating. And I said, oh, I'm dripping soup all over myself. And oh. then realized, no, I wasn't. There was a hole in my chest and there was liquid coming out of it. I was still draining. <laughs> I was still draining. I called up the doctor and I said, um, this may not be a good sign, but I've got like a, a cup and a half, I'm like holding a glass under my chest and this like, oh, that's okay. You're just draining extra. Like, it's just saying. Like, oh, casual. Why don't they tell you that? No one tells you anything. That's why we need your book. Doctors don't tell you got some, You got to read the book. You, got, you guys, you guys got to read the book. It's juicy. It's warm. You know, it's exactly. I love it. And, um, I think that's about it. As as we have a we have a nice comment from someone named Marie saying you are the best, and I agree. Thank you so much. Right. You are, are, you gonna, are you going to see Alan coming? Or you just work at the theater. He's going to be here in my small fictional town in Connecticut. He's oh, playing, amazing! You know, he's doing that 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 show with a friend of his. Oh, with Ari Shapiro. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. Here, like in two Saturdays or three Saturdays from now. Amazing. So I, I haven't seen their show. I need to go see it. But I see him every now and then at the club. Yeah, he comes and he bartends. Oh, good. Well, tell him, tell him hello. I I'm, will. He's the best. You know, since we did Gently Downstream and he he came. And, oh, amazing. So, okay. I love it. Well, you well, take thank you um, And thank you for your book. It's, fa oh, it's thank fabulous. You. Thank you for having it. And, and, and everybody, it's available. It's available, y'all. Available. Don't be shy. Time to be a major motion picture. Oh, it'd be a long, it'd be a long one. Just teasing. <laughs> All right. Be good. Awesome. All right. Have a great night. Thank you for doing this. Of course. My pleasure. Bye-bye.